we're going out to Dr. Paul Detloff's lab between Blair and Arcadia to learn a little bit more about veterinary medicine and some of the things that he's got going on at the lab. Well, hello. Oh, hi. Good to see you. Glad to see you. Okay. Come on right in. How awesome is this, Dr. Paul? Well, now that we're inside, Dr. Paul, this is so interesting. We're going to take just a minute. Fill us in on your history a little bit. Okay. I was a Minnesota farm boy, born 100 miles straight west of here on a really flat, heavy black land farm. Uh, born in 42, and we had chickens. We had pigs sows and we bought feeder pigs and we had 12 to 15 milk cows. The whole Midwest, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa was diversified farming. In, Dotted with farms on every 40 and every 80. Every, we had 120 acres, yep. And they were 160 acres is a pretty big farm and there were 80s. Um, my folks taught me how to work. They taught me the value of a dollar, and they raised me in a Christian atmosphere. And in 1960, I headed off with my grandpa's leather suitcase to college, knowing I was probably never going back to the farm. And kind of what was your aspiration at that time? What was your point of interest to pull you off of the farm? Um, I could see that you had to have education. And in 1957, Russia put up a satellite called Sputnik with a dog in it. And all of a sudden, America was behind in the space race. Uh, we needed engineers. We needed civil engineers, mechanical, electrical, and that. Being a farm boy that never got more than 60 miles away from the farm, I had no clue. And I thought, well, maybe I'll be an ag engineer. Oh, okay. So I went to Mankato State which is Minnesota State at Mankato now, for one year in pre-engineering. Uh, transferred to the University of Minnesota because I got a job up there in the summer after my first year of college. And I was working for the maintenance department on the ag campus in St. Paul and spent a lot of time in the ag, in the veterinary buildings. And so one day I walked in to admissions and uh, inquired what do I need to be a veterinarian and we had a veterinarian in our, in our hometown that was uh, very esteemed and very good and he, he was sort of a, a everybody's idol and so I thought well maybe I should be a veterinarian. In 67 I graduated uh, after seven years of schooling and uh, came to Arcadia, Wisconsin they kept track of the assessors, kept track of how many female cows were in each county. And it was oh. in the tax record. And I looked at Buffalo and Tremplo County, and there was a lot of cattle in these two counties because of our, the driftless area in our geolo geology, the terrain dictated livestock. And uh, there were some older veterinarians, and there was a veterinary practice for sale in Arcadia that I bought. And so I... Uh, I built a four-man practice in about five or six years because we brought modern veterinary medicine. Post-World War II, the training in veterinary schools really, really improved. You know, years ago, 1900, you go to the Chicago School of Veterinary Medicine for six months and you learn what plants did what, you know. And so after World War II, they really turned up the education and we were we brought modern veterinary medicine to the forefront after World War II. Animal care really, really shifted. It really changed during that time oh, period, yes. didn't it? Yes, it really did. And the pharmaceutical world jumped in with both feet and they came out. They were coming out with new drugs every month, new antibiotics, new hormones. And it was uh, in the boom, 70s were the boom, every boom time when every, you go up Glencoe Valley, there would be a new silo going up every week and uh, you, 
And then Earl Butts, our Secretary of Agriculture, back said, you got to get big or get out. Yes. And so the 30 cow herd couldn't make it anymore. So you had to have 60 cows to make it. And as the older people uh, transitioned out and uh, uh, retired, and you had the newer generation, the price of land slowly kept going up. So you did need more animals and more acres to make a living. And so they were caught between that squeeze there. And well, so and, and at that same time period, you know, there was a lot more introduction of fence row to fence row row crops. Yep. The diet of a lot of the, the bovines, the cows, the sheep, the pigs, the diets were Changed. all changing. And yep. at that same time period, there was an increased demand for veterinarians, was there not? Yes. Uh, when I came to Arcadia, we had a lot of permanent pasture and a lot of hay fields. And corn silage was fed limited. Uh, there was no soybeans being fed. Uh, uh, there was no soybeans, I bet, being grown at that time. No, that was a whole new paradigm. In southern Minnesota, they, they were being grown, but they were being sold. They weren't being fed. But uh, then they, the production, we needed more production. Our whole 70s, 80s, and 90s, and even up till now, it's how many, how fast can you get a pig to market? Uh, how fast can you get a five pound broiler? Uh, can we get this cow to milk 100 pounds a day? You know, what do we got to do to get her there? And so uh, how many tonnage of corn silage is all on tonnage? And we never focused on what's in the food. Uh, there's quality. We never even heard about bricks. How many bricks are in uh, the fruit or bricks are in food or bricks? And that, that that's... Uh, the quality was not an issue, it was all quantity. And uh, after we started with the salt-based fertilizers and the chemicals, we did some really major damage to our soil, our microbes in our soil. We didn't realize that, that the microbes in the soil are the same in the rumen, and they're really, really vital to protect the, to create the organic matter that comes in the fall from the wheat stubble and the corn stalks, that has to be broken down into humus, which puts it back in the carbon cycle. These big, long molecules of lignin are digested by LJ, fungi, nematodes, arthropods, and they're all breaking that down. Tiny little critters, though. Tiny little critters. There's more critters in a spoonful of dirt than there are on this planet. There's like eight, nine, ten billion little critters in a spoonful of dirt. And we didn't know that, and that's been an area in the last 10 to 20 years that has really been investigated. Um, it's known that uh, these pesticides and, and uh, glyphosate just devastates them. And then you get compacted soil. You, you lose what's called tilth. Yes. You want chocolate cake soil. Fluffy. Fluffy. And I've been in Australia, New Zealand, and Holland, and... Holland has the best chocolate cake soil I've ever seen. It just, you can take 10 gallons of water and pour it in a hole and it'll, and it won't run off. Sponge you know. it, suck it right up. Yep. And uh, Well now, coming back to, you moved to Arcadia, you got settled in, you started growing this practice during, at which in the agriculture world, animal diets were changing, soil health yep. was changing. And coming out of the college environment, was it more of a like a conventional type of, of learning environment? These are the tools to that industry is giving us to use for cows? Totally, totally. It was uh, the pharmaceutical companies uh, and Big Pharma really has a handle in the vet schools and in the medicines and in the FDA. Uh, it has to be a, a federally approved drug to go into livestock. They don't, they don't recognize uh, the normal things we used back in the 1900s. Uh, uh, Doc Hensel was in Arcadia in the early 1900s down on Main Street and he had a big back lot. And I heard from all the old timers when I got here in 67 that, oh, Doc Hensel grew these herbs in his backyard and he would fix this cow that I knew was gonna die. And old grandpa would stand there and say, should have called Doc Hensel, he'd fix her. And he was growing echinacea, he was growing comfrey, he was growing a lot of these herbs that 
um, they learned personal observation is the most reliable source of truth. And that's been from eons on back. Uh, the paleo man kept telling the younger people, here this herb, the old lady with the leather pouch of herbs, she knew that if this herb, like uh, squaw rut, yes. was introduced, that's blue quash, that has mega, mega, mega estrogens. And we use that routinely on a retained placenta or to evacuate a mummy or if the uterus has uh, some pus in it four weeks after calving, uh, colophyllum tincture, which is blue coash, will give, open up the cervix and give the uterus tone. So how many years were you a practicing vet in Arcadia? I practiced 35 years, uh, never missed a day from being sick. Uh, how many sleeves did you use? <laughs> I know, Too many to the count? <laughs> I know that I have reached in to do pregnancy checks and to uh, uh, do a physical. You can learn a lot with a rectal prolapse. You can feel the kidney. You can feel uh, the lymph nodes. You can feel everything. And you look at the manure to see how it's digested. And so I know I did over, I reached in over a million cows in 35 years which wore my right hip out because I pushed off on my right hip. And how did it wear on your rotator cuff? It was not good. Because some of those cows, and they're my, not necessarily conducive to that. See that knuckle there? This, this, is, this was bigger, and uh, I mean, from doing rectals. Yeah. And I lost this feeling in this finger. My daughter with acupuncture and essential oils brought that. that I couldn't move that finger five years ago. It was dead. That peristaltic wave is hard, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Just yep. crushes you down. Now, whereabouts in your career? Because you're a veterinarian, 35 years, that's a long, long time. Well, I, I planned to practice all my life until I really had a lot of hip pain. And I couldn't catch that Angus cross calf, you know? Yeah. Guy had eight calves in the pen to vaccinate for brucellosis. And one of them was an Angus cross and that old, good old girl that wouldn't breed, so you threw a bull in her. Well, Doc will vaccinate her too. Well, I could catch that Angus. I mean, I was a vain German. I went all conference football. Don't tell me I can't get her. And all of a sudden, I couldn't catch that calf anymore. And I was backing up and I'd stumble. And, and uh, my, I had a classmate that got kicked in the face by a horse and spent uh, months, months in the university hospital took him out of practice. And my wife kept saying, you're going to get hurt if you don't do something with your hip, and, and she was right. Uh, being a vain der German, I listened to her, but didn't hear her for two years. But uh, So I left practice. Uh, in 1988, I had a philosophical change when I saw my first cow that the farmer had aspirations of going organic. And I saw her on a very hot day in July Beautiful cow in Wamandi, in Wamandi Valley. Yep, Holstein cow. And you know the, the good farmers in Wamandi Valley. They've don't got have, incredible, incredible it, cows. Yeah, that area was very, very, very good to me. And I had left my group practice and was practicing alone at the time. And I went out there and here's this beautiful cow that had twins and a big placenta hanging out this July Hot. with 90 degree temperature, 95% humidity. And she had stepped on one of her teats in front, and she had a really hot hemolytic E. coli mastitis, I thought, 107 temp. And this girl was hurting. And the best asset a veterinarian has, Mary, is to give a complete and thorough physical, which I would always do. You don't just go in and look at the udder and say, well, here's what we're going to do. You look at the whole cow. The whole picture. And, you wanna, and I always put a driveway dollar on this cow. If she was a heifer, beautiful heifer. And I think she's going to stay in a herd six years, and she's going to milk 20,000 pounds of milk. And let's say milk is $15 a hundred. That's $3,000 a year income, and they're going to have a calf worth 500. She's going to be there five years. This is a $20,000 baby I'm working on. So I'd always assign a driveway dollar to that cow. And the vet interns that we had that I that came from Auburn and Missouri and that, I'd say, what's that cow worth? Because they didn't have a clue. And so you know, I want to know what you're dealing with. So I gave this cow a physical, and she was sick. And I mentally thought, I've got to throw the kitchen sink at this girl or we could lose her. 
And the farmer said, you know, I'm looking at this group of farmers down by Viroqua that uh, they want this better milk. They don't want antibiotics. They don't want this and that. And he said, uh, you can't use antibiotics on her. And I said, snap my head around because I'm Joe Conventional for 21 years. And I said, what? You can't use antibiotics on her. You can't use a hormone to drain, uh, get that placenta out. Uh, I can't put tetracycline in her uterus. No. Nope. You can't use dipyrone, which is a drug illegal today, to lower the temperature. You can't use antihistamine. And I'm looking at my pharmaceutical box and I'm thinking, well, what in the world can I give this girl? And he said, well, you can give her fluids. She's uh, dehydrated probably, and you can give her energy, maybe some glucose. And I said, okay. So I gave her a bottle of glucose and some lactated ringers. And I said, why don't you look the other way and I'll put a uterine pill in her. Yeah. He said, no, you can't. And so I treated her and I hated to write the bill up because I wasn't helping him. And I got home that night and I told my wife, I said, this organics is going to be scary. I don't have anything I can do for them. Well, and you're looking at really a savings account for this farmer. She dies unexpected asset conversion of a couple thousand dollars yeah, at yeah. least. And my wife being a tough German uh, you know my wife, you know what her response was? She didn't feel sorry for me in Christ. She said, why don't you learn something about those old ways? Oh, so it does boil down to the woman behind the man. Oh, you're going to love this interview, aren't you? <laughs> I am, I am. <laughs> and young fella, take that to heart. It took me years to know that my wife has an intuition, and women do. When they say, I got a hunch or I got a feeling, listen because it usually is true. So I started reading. I started reading. I read a book on the scientific validation of aloe vera. And aloe vera does 15 things. It stimulates the immune system in a high fever. It counteracts cortisol, which is stress. It heals epithelium. What's epithelium? Well, that's what's in the inside of a uterus. And I thought, hey, I can put aloe vera in a cow's uterus. And aloe vera is been looked at by the FDA and it's in a classification of drugs called GRAS. G-R-A-S. It's generally regarded as safe. Oh, so okay. you can use aloe vera legally on a cow. So I started playing around with aloe vera. And then I heard that echinacea tincture turns on the immune system. And I thought, boy, that'd be good for a sick cow to turn her immune system on. And so I started tincturing started tincturing with vodka. What's, whoa, time out. What's tincturing? Tincturing. Tincturing. Now we're, we're getting into some right definition here. and technology. Yeah. There's, we make a Dr. Paul's botanicals, which are plant products that are mainly pills, and liquids that are tincture. What a tincture is, it's when you put a plant, this is garlic. Garlic was our first antibiotic. We've improved the mousetrap in the last 15 or 19 years. This was my first organic antibiotic. There are 15 molecules in the garlic bulb. They are named. They know the structure. They know where the C's, the O's, and the H's are chemically, chemistry, and they kill bacteria. How they're, they're bound and put together, correct? Yep, correct. And it's not a joke. I mean, and garlic was used in the dark ages during the plague when they had pastorella pestis that took 25% of the people off this earth at, during the dark ages. And the serfs that were living out in the country in these little hodls, uh, hovels, if they were drying garlic bulbs in their basement, they didn't get the plague. And they knew that there's something in garlic that keeps the plague away. And if you ever go up to the Renaissance Festival at Chippewa Falls or Shakopee, you'll see that they'll have a leather strap with a garlic clove here. And that, the aromatherapy from a garlic clove protected them from the plague. Wow. And they had no science or personal observation was the most reliable source of truth that people that had garlic around didn't get sick. And that's then in modern times with the introduction of chemistry, they dug in and found out. So you take a universal solvent. The universal solvent is usually an alcohol based. So I started, we've, we've got our garlic cloves. Yep, you take your, your crush up garlic cloves. 
And in the crushing process, you will form some of these molecules. One of them is allicin, and allicin is an antibiotic, one of the 35. And so I started with vodka. We went to organic alcohol, and the creme de creme is 190 proof organic ethyl alcohol from cane sugar because cane has not been GMO'd. Okay. And organically, we cannot have GMOs or anything non-organic. And so we get five-gallon containers of 190 proof ethyl alcohol, which requires an alcohol and tobacco and firearms license, which is $250 a year. We cannot sell any. We have to keep track of the use of it. And you put a little bit of apple cider vinegar in there because apple cider vinegar helps the tincture be absorbed into the body. And every cell in the body, you have a sodium-potassium pump. If that cell needs a negative boron, that sodium-potassium pump will kick out a negative hydrogen so it stays balanced electrically. And there's phospholipid membranes. There are threes, fives, and sevens on every membrane of every cell, and that's where that sodium-potassium pump works. A apple cider vinegar in the tincture speeds up absorption on the cellular level. And that's important. That's important. Because there were cows yep. and animals and people are made up of cells. lots of cells. Yep. And the other thing we do is we have some structured water. Structured water is new in the last five years. I belong to a think tank, and I brought that home from my think tank out in, from Florida. Structured water is when you run water through a vortex in the presence of crystals. It changes the ability of water to carry things and to handle things. Water is normally a 10-sided tetrahedron, and when you structure it, it gets larger, and it, it has more power. Like the conventional spraying industry, if they're going to put a chemical on, if they use structured water as a carrier with a pH of 7, they can cut their ingredients in half. Wow. The medical community is looking at structured water. Anybody listening to this, Google structured water in a very interesting book is called Dancing with Water by two 60-year-old quantum physicists, two gals, uh, Melanie Berg, and uh, I don't remember her first name, but it's Pangman, P-A-N-G-M-E-N, -E Berg and Pangman. No, Evans, not Berg, yeah, Melanie Evans, senior moment, excuse me. Uh, Dancing with Water, and that is a really interesting book. You're going to see the alternative medical world use structured water. We drink structured water here all the time. So that's a tincture. And these herbs had to have different things. Uh, they'll do different things depending. We'll tincture plants that are loaded with phytohormones. Phytohormones. Is that like red clover? Red clover is full of estrogens. Yes, it's yes. It's called promensal in a drugstore. It's got four estrogens. This is nature's cycle, and there's seven herbs in here that are loaded with phytohormones. And when I have a cow that is not showing heat because she's in a negative energy state, let's say she calves and boy is she milking and yep. she's a candidate for ketosis or she maybe had a little subclinical ketosis and she's just working her heart out. Her ener the first thing that shuts down when you run out of something like energy is reproduction. Mm -hmm. You watch the Olympics and these gals that are swimmers and that and these athletes that run, they're not cycling. They're putting every ounce of energy into that running. Yep. And when they get done with the Olympics, they'll start cycling again. Well, this cow that's working is not cycling. And if we put five cc's of this tincture in her mouth uh, every day for twice a day for eight, ten days, she will balance herself out of all these tinctures. There's progesterone progenitors, there's androgens, there's testosterone, there's uh, um, um, prostaglandins, meaning the whole plethora of phytohormones in a plant is the same as in you and I. My androgen's the same as in a plant. Your estrogen's the same in a plant. My testosterone's the same in a plant. So I'm, I'm feeding this animal these, this tincture with all these phytohormones. So you're essentially using what's available in the natural world and getting into a form that's released and absorbable into 
the whatever species of livestock needs it. You've got it, Murray. Anything that's grown by Mother Nature is about 98% absorbable. Anything that's made in a lab, and see, because this is grown by Mother Nature, there's no side effects. You can take the same molecule, like the BST molecule that they came out with, Monsanto, and see. And that's bovine somatotropin. Yes, and that hit hit uh, 30 years ago, 25 years ago, and everybody jumped on it. And there's a side effect from that. I mean, uh, eventually you use it long enough, the cows will go cysting on it and that. But it's made in a lab, and it doesn't have the frequency of life of anything that grew by Mother Nature. And so the side effects of any synthesized molecule will bother us. You read the drug ads on TV and there's always a side effect. Well, when Mother it's Nature... not a side effect, it's like 17 pages of side effects <laughs> if you read the tiny little print that you need yeah. the magnifying glasses to read. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it, it, it got to be a real fun trip. Um, so I started making these things and what? And so when you, when, okay, the first bottle, the very first bottle of your garlic. Yeah. So did you call your farmer up and say, no, I, I've got a, I've got something. I, you, let me know when you got a sick cow because we're going to spin this out on her. Uh, well, I, I was developing this while I was practicing. My, after 21 years of practice, I practiced 14 more years. And so I'd come up with something and a guy would say, you know, I need to give this cow a shot to get her in heat. And I'd say, okay, why don't to try something? I mean, and I picked my battles. Yeah. Some people didn't want to hear about this. But there's three kinds of farmers, wherever you go. I worked for Organic Valley 16 years, and I've been to Maine, to Oregon, to New Zealand. Uh, and there's a farmer that is sitting on the edge of his chair. What's coming next? What's the new spray? What's the new this? What can I try? And he's, he's a conventional all the way. He's going fence row to fence row. And probably isn't crawled into his ecosystem very good. Then there's the biological guy. And he's not the guy that's pushing so much. And he notices he's probably a pretty good observer. And some things he's doing he doesn't like. But he doesn't like killing all this stuff with these sprays. And he doesn't like that. And so he'll listen. And then there's a th their third group, and they're the organic ones. And they've really crawled in, and they want to learn. Open mind. Um, and so I would pick my battles. And I knew this guy, and a lot of times the women would be the first to grasp it. I had many farms where the wife would do the infusing. Are, are you catching that? <laughs> it's girl farmers again. Here we go. <laughs> and if somebody on the farm could infuse, and I had a retained placenta that was, it had no proteolysis, it hadn't even started to deteriorate, and it was just tight as a fiddle string. And, and the worst thing you can do is dig around in there for 20 minutes and try and get those things separated off. Cause right. The, the well, top, they're, not, they're not ready to go. No, the top of that cotyledon, you, you try and push and you're going to put bacteria, all kinds of garbage right into that cow's bloodstream, and tomorrow she'll have a headache and a 102.4 temperature from you digging in there. And so I just back out and I say, man, we should infuse her four times in the next 10 days. And Mary, you, you know how to pass the pipette or how to do that? You bet, because I got little hands. Yeah, and so I'd say, okay, here. You don't need to call me for four days. You're going to mix up this aloe vera. We're going to put colophyllum in it. And let's throw CEG, which is our new antibiotic, instead of garlic, in there. And then I got this organic uterus pill. Grab that fresh cow bowl. It's right there on your right shoulder. This one? Yeah. This is an organic uterine pill. And it's got sodium bicarbonate in it, which is a base. And what does sodium bicarbonate do to the pH of a rumen or of a, of a uterus? Changes it. Changes it to the pH of 8. And what's 8? pH of 8 is alkaline. Alkaline. Bacteria want to live at 6.5. Yes. I just changed the terrain so bacteria will not reproduce in the uterus with those pills. My antibiotic in here is garlic. And if you look, you're going to see little capsules. There's capsules in here. At the end of that, there's a little capsule. There's a couple capsules in here that are aloe vera. Aloe vera powder. So I'm giving this cow aloe vera to heal the epithelium. Garlic is an antibiotic and sodium bicarbonate. All safe. All safe. You could feed this to your children and it is going to hurt them. 
and that and then I infuse aloe vera over the top of it along with that blue cohosh that gives the uterus tone. The organic treatment for uteruses is unbelievable. In fact, over half of what we make for the uterus goes into conventional herds because there's no antibiotics. So there's no can, withholding. There's no withholding. And to kind of just explain withholding is in, in conventional medicine, if you're using an antibiotic, that antibiotic's going to get injected into that animal. And the product of that that comes from that animal, whether it's milk or meat, because of the presence of the antibiotic, it has to be milk withheld or withheld from slaughter. So you can't send that animal Correct. in to become like hamburger or steaks or roasts for so many days. Correct. And see, I've seen the whole wheel turn because in 1967, Charles Pfizer Labs had the first really heavily used antibiotic was called Combiotic. Came in a little brown bottle, 100 milliliters, costs about $5, back when milk was $4 a hundred, and everybody gave 20 cc's of that for mastitis, for foot rot, for pneumonia, and this is penicillin and dihydrostreptomycin in oil. Oh. And you never dumped the milk. You were, didn't worry about it. See, this when everything comes out, it's new, it's safe, don't worry about it. You don't find out till 25 years later there's or a problem. Or th three years or five years later when these people would drink milk with penicillin in it, they'd have a violent reaction. Because they're allergic to penicillin. Yes, they were sensitized to it for two, three, four months, and then all of a sudden they got a dose of it and their eyes swelled shut and <laughs> couldn't hardly breathe, and so all of a sudden... Uh, combiotic and this combiotic in oil if you got it in between muscle layers back in the leg or in the hip and you know you got these strands of muscles that do things if it got between there it'd be in there for 90 100 days just putting a little bit into the bloodstream all the time so whoa that was that was shocking when uh, I go out and tell my farmers well now you got to hold milk 48 hours I'm not holding any milk 48 hours I'm gonna sell the milk we need to be policed because some people don't play by the rules, and so they came up with these tests. Yeah. And these tests now, the charm and the snap and all them, these tests are so accurate, they can pick up parts per billion. In fact, a, a tanker of milk that's 53,000 or 50,000 pounds of milk, if one guy infuses a cow with tetracycline, two tetracycline pills the size of this It'll show up in that tanker. One cow. Wow. And they say, okay, we were on four farms here. Some, who is, who is the rat in the wood pile that infused a cow? And so it, antibiotic withholding is, 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 the antibiotics have been overused. There's resistance to it. Most of these tough mastitis bug organisms they have, there's an antibody that'll touch them. Well, and one of the comments I just wanted to add to this discussion is because of the overuse, and in my lifetime of being on a farm, you could pretty much do just about anything you needed to do with penicillin. Penicillin really seemed to yep. be the ticket. When it came out, it was amazing. But then over time, every year there seemed to be a new one, a new one, more expensive, more expensive, more expensive. Yes. And in my work with Pew Charitable Trust, in the overuse, recognizing the overuse of antibiotics in the animal industry and how it affects people, yes. we've kind of hit a wall in terms of the development of new antibiotics. There is nobody on the planet today in the drug world working on a new antibiotic. I just got That's done. That's kind of scary. I just got done with, uh, I have to do continuing education every year to keep my degree or my certificate. And I, I went over to Minnesota's, which was in Rochester. And last fall I was in Madison to keep up with what's due. And uh, the antibiotic world's over. They found these bacteria can mutate the DNA and it won't touch them. They are also saying that like Ivomec, if you've used Ivomec in the last four, three, four years, 
or three, four, five times in the last 10 years, it's probably 25% effective because these parasites and, have mutated. And Ivomec is... A wormer. And so, the, that gets put onto cows and in poured on their back on or their injected. Back, injected. Half of it comes out in the manure. Which affects your biological which life. Which kills... And right, yep. because it'll kill uh, kill everything in the soil for a, quite a big circle there at cow It just sterilizes the ground, and uh, so it's uh, the paradigm in uh, pharmaceutical world is really switched, and we're we're going into prevention. Um, I fortunately, after uh, about twenty five years of practice, started going to some soil seminars by uh, the people that were teaching the Elbrick system. And now let's talk a little bit about Albrecht because I was exposed to him for like 15 sentences in one of my college soils classes and told kind of a little anecdotal joke and then we moved on to another really yeah. diagnostic type of soil science and soil understanding. Okay. William Albrecht was a plant pathologist at the University of Missouri, uh, 30s and 40s, and he, our NPK fertilization is based on the Van Liebig, uh, the German, and Van Liebig said if you um, take four ton of hay off this field and it's 0.4% potassium, uh, times 4,000, uh, you, you need uh, 160 pounds of potassium you just taken, so we better put that back on. Kind of a reductionist. It's a reductionist thinking. Okay, a lot of our farms have way too much potassium on already from the urine and manure for after 150 years of farming, and the manure and the urine all has high potassium, and so he said, okay, what do I need to grow a good plant? And he was talking perennial grasses and, and hays. And so the soil has got a negative charge. And so what sticks to a negative soil are your positives, and they're called cations. The negative ones are anions. And so he did extensive research. The main cations are calcium with two pluses, potassium with one plus, magnesium with two pluses. Those are the three heavy hitters. You need a little sodium, that's a plus. And if the pH is seven, you have no hydrogen. And he found out that if you stack this soil up and you have of the shelving in here, and that's called cation exchange capacity. How many cations can you exchange on here on this negative? If you got soil like my dad's farm in Grand Meadow, Minnesota, with five feet of black soil, glacial soil, you got a big gas tank. If you got soil like in Sulphur Springs, Texas, where we tried to bring on some farmers in the organic world, and I went down and visited five farms when I went to work for Organic Valley, and they had low sand with 0.6 organic matter, oh. you know, and they, they cattle aren't going to thrive on that at all. And so um, we'll get that later. So you want 70% of the layers to be calcium. 70 to 75%, about 15 to 18% of the shelving should be magnesium and potassium 5 to 8 and if you get a pH of 6.5 to 6.8 and you have this ratio, you will grow a good grass. And a good grass or hay, when I was doing training farmers for Organic Valley, which I still am, I would say, here's your lesson. The rumen is made for grass and hay, not seeds. That's because that's the rumen is actually a giant fermentation bath. For, yes, full of the same thing that's in the soil, except for earthworms and dung beetles, but the rest is the same. And so, and what do you want to grow? You want to grow a full stemmed, not a soda straw, a full stemmed, highly mineralized, high bricks. Bricks is a 
refractometer that measures the total dissolved solids. It's not just sugar. We think of bricks as sugar. Like when you boil down maple syrup, you boil that down till you get a high bricks, then you quit. Or you take the sap of a plant and you can see good grass, you want 10, 12 bricks, which is hard to get. A lot that's, of, that's BRX. B-R-I-X. Yes. And that was named after a wine grower in France that was growing a sweet wine. And his name was Anton Brix. That's how the Brix oh, refractometer okay. got. And so you want this highly mineralized, high Brix, full stemmed grass or hay with a pH of 6.5 to 6.8 and you will have a healthy cattle. Because when the Brix is up, the calcium's up, you got everything in the sap of that plant in the xylem and phloem that the cow needs. So essentially it goes back to one of the things that we talk about often on Farmer's Corner. Uh, healthy soil equates into a healthy plant. plant. A healthy plant equates into a healthy mm -hmm. animal. And a healthy animal eventually joins our food web and, and could, yep. could translate into maybe healthier people in the big, yep. the big picture. <laughs> It all starts in the soil. It all starts in the soil. After I wore my hip out, I had been working on my little box. And Organic Valley would call me. I was putting meetings on marketing. And Organic Valley would call me and say, you know, we've got six farmers down at Cuba City that are really afraid of coming organic because they're losing their antibiotics. And the big thing was they're losing their dry cow mastitis tubes. We, we did a blitzkrieg of selling dry cow mastitis tubes. They got introduced in about 71. And I know in 72 at Arcadia in my clinic, we called 250 farmers in for Upjohn, paid for the meal. And we're going to sell mastitis tubes. Now explain a little bit to the audience here, what is a mastitis tube? Everybody okay. knows what mastitis is. It's an infection in the mammary system. Okay, and previous to the 70s, mastitis was not a cow killer. I mean, I did not see in my first five years of practice very many mastitis cows that were just really, really hurting. I would hear about them. I'd be there doing some other work and they'd say, oh, she had mastitis last week. What did you do? I gave her 20 cc's of combiotic. That's when penicillin got it all. Okay. And by using that over and over, the drug, they mutated. And so the mastitis got more virulent. And all of a sudden we could see these hemolytic E. coli that would just blow that udder up, 106 temperature, and some of them would die. Yeah. And that was like, a, whoa, what's happening here? So they came out with a new drug, an antibiotic called Novobiosin, up John. And they thought, let's save this one. And let's put this in a 12 milliliter tube in a, in a carrier. And let's, every time we dry a cow off, let's put one in each quarter and we're gonna kill all those buggers. We didn't know that these bacteria were so good at mutating then. We hadn't learned that, see? Just like we hadn't learned people was going to react to penicillin in the combiotic. And so it's, it's always been a learning process. And you look back and you think, whoa, that was a mistake. And so we called our farmers in and we sold. And we, the drug companies, I witnessed this and it just irritated me how Upjohn sold these tubes is by fear and intimidation. And they, you, you're not taking good care of your cows unless you do what we tell you. How many come? Yeah. And this one guy came into the meeting late and sat up front and said, how many cows you got? And he said, uh, 30. A very good farmer of ours, very good farmer. And he said, how many teats on your cows? And he said, well, four. And so he said, you got 120, you need 10 boxes. Have you used 10 boxes of BioDry? And he said, no, I haven't ever bought any. He said, really? Aren't you worried about staff? And with the crowning blows, he said, how many children you got? And he said, three. And he said, don't you care about your family? And I thought, you got to be kidding me. I mean, he just totally embarrassed this guy. And that's how we sell, that's how the drug industry, I'm sorry, is sold. It's, you watch it on TV every night. Yes. Don't you take care of your mother with Alzheimer's? She needs to get on this drug. I mean, it's, it's or, putting us on a guilt trip. Or ask your doctor about this. 
because you need it even though you don't have any idea what it's for <laughs> yes so anyway um so you kind of you you were a pioneer just by listening a little bit and doing some experimentation and obviously you may have must have had positive end results there's because about, there's more than three different types of homeopathic remedies oh yeah there's here in the lab there's over a hundred different remedies in here and and i have 50 of them i threw away that didn't work you know personal observation and and I got the Pioneer Award from Organic Valley a couple of years ago because I jumped out of the box. When I started using aloe vera in the uterus, farmers laughed at me, and veterinarians. That law sticking some plant juice in these cow's uterus. Well, see, and that's one of the questions I, I mean, how was, when I work with my, my farmers, and even on my own farm, I look at my farm as an experimental station. It's my laboratory. I have to find out what's going to work on my farm but my peer group may not necessarily agree with some of the things that I'm doing in my experimental station. How were you received by your colleagues in the veterinary world when you started playing around with juice in cows? You go through three stages. You go, and this happens no matter what. The first stage is you get laughed at. And I got laughed at. I got laughed at. The second stage, when I saw this, this works, this works. And when you know it, it's right, you do it. And Voltaire, the French philosopher, says what's right will prevail. And I just always had that hanging here. This is so right for the environment, for the food, and I just know it. I don't care what you think. I'm a German. That's probably my problem. And anyway, uh, then I'd be condemned. We've got to stop him. Can't the FDA do something about that? Aloe vera in the uterus, and now when the organics has grown and there's some science behind it, and there's some very successful, and we see this is what we want in the food, then it becomes the bandwagon. And so I saw it laughed on, condemned, and now the bandwagon. And I get calls to speak all over the United States. I just got back from New Zealand in February or March. The OMSCO, I'm going to go to Europe, to England in February. They want me to come over there. And so I'm on the bandwagon now. And so um, you, just, you just have to have a conviction and, and look at it and know this is, this is real. And now in the creation of these, of these remedies, because I don't know, can you, what can you call them legally? I mean, the FDA... Supplements. Supplements. See, now, see, all of these pills, they are registered with DATCAP, Department of Ag, Transportation, and Consumer Protection. It's a feed additive. Anything that's a feed additive, you see everything here. Here's the ingredients. There's ingredients here have been tested in a lab. Cost me $71 to get these ingredients. You can see calcium phosphorus, it goes right on down the line. They have to be in a certain order, and we have to pay a tonnage to the state of Wisconsin and the state of Minnesota, where we're registered every year. A, a, a tonnage fee. Okay. A tonnage fee. I mean, how much ingredients go into these? I mean, there's uh, uh, potassium sulfate yep. and mag sulfate and calcium chloride and calcium sulfate, all these... 50 pound bags I have in the garage, I pay a tonnage fee on. The tinctures are supplements. The only thing, we cannot make any claims. I cannot say this is used as an antibiotic. We can have no claims. This was called, well this, this is keto care. This was called a uterine blend. And okay. the FDA said you're making a claim. Oh, because you're targeting the uterus. the uterus. So it's a fresh cow bolus. And so they've reviewed, uh, they've reviewed everything. Swine X. You have no idea what it is. It is a wormer. And here's uh, analysis, and here's the ingredients. This has got neem bark in it, ginger root, garlic bulb, diatomaceous earth, and black walnut hulls. And I have the formula, and the formula tests out that this is what's in it. If I change this, i got to retest it and have the proper... The whole nine yards. whole nine yards. Everything in here that you see in all of these containers. Um, 
this really had to take a lot of dedication on your part. A lot of reading. I, I mean, just to a start off with a couple of different experiments to say, okay, how do we go with this? What were some of the books that you were reading? I mean, I've read like Soil, Grass, uh, and Cancer by Andre Vossin that makes yeah, some I've very got, interesting linkages. I'll take you in the basement and show you my books. I mean, there's a plethora of them. And there's a lot of new ones now. Matthew Wood and uh, Stephen Buhner, new people that have, that have put science behind it. And, and uh, yeah, I read all the time. I don't watch TV or drink beer, so I read. <laughs> um, so Organic Valley started, uh, can you work next Wednesday? Yep, I will. And so can you work two days next week? No, it's... March and I got calves to vaccinate and dehorn before flies and they kept saying we need you more. So when my hip went south, I called them and said I can give you more time now. And when I went to work for Organic Valley, there was, they had 400 farmers in 17 different groups. They called it a pool. You know, like around Whitehall, Arcadia here, this mm -hmm. is a pool. And then you get over to Utica and Lewiston and St. Charles, Minnesota, that's a pool. And my job was to go and teach the farmers. I had three legs to my stool that I taught. And because these are conventional farms that they don't know any, this was all in kindergarten. Now there's a vast amount of knowledge out there on this stuff. Even the conventional people know that echinacea is a stimulant. And, but I work on the soils. If you're going to transition into organic, you got three years. You're going to learn to either put lime on or gypsum or soft rock phosphate, or you're going to get a $25 soil test and get somebody that knows the Albrecht system. The soils, and number two, is you're going to learn how to feed the cow. We're not going to feed her 50, 60 pounds of corn silage and 20 pounds of corn and distillers. So when you bring distillers into your barn, you're bringing a whole raft of poisons. The the germ of the, of the corn the distillers has got all of that Synthesized molecules. Yes. To be healthy in America, perfectly healthy, if you could eat only what Mother Nature grew and nothing that was synthesized in the lab, you'd stay pretty healthy. I don't want to see Organic Valley or Organic Farmers give anything to a cow. They wouldn't eat themselves, drink themselves, or give to their kids. Yeah, that, those are some pretty solid parameters. They are, and if you can't under if you can't even pronounce it on the label, you know that's made in the lab, and it's got a frequency that's going to cause some kind of a side effect or do something. And so, so the the we we I want them to come in with sixty five percent of their diet is grass or hay, and they're not going to milk one hundred and twenty pounds. Uh, the average organic cows in the 50 pounds, jerseys in them are 45. Uh, and what really, I had 23 people in my practice, uh, Mary, that went organic and they would just back off. A lot of them either weren't making money or didn't like what they're doing and they said, I'm going to just... I'm just going to stop the hemorrhaging, and I'm not going to buy all that $600 a ton grain. I'm, not, I'm just going to back off. And when I'd go to work with them and say, okay, your farm needs gypsum, your, or your farm needs uh, lime, and then you've got to come in with sulfur and boron, really important, uh, the soils. And when you first hit a farm that's all beat up with some of the Elbrecht things, you get a, quite a response. Oh, yes, definitely. And, it take, and it maybe in three, four years it kind of mellows out, but you want to keep at it. And uh, when I would have a guy that was, uh, I had an $18,000 account one day on 50 cows, and I walked in the barn, and he was busy in the shop or something, and I would just walked up and down 50 cows, and I had 24 of them that I'd done left side DA surgeries on. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that's a displaced abomasum or a twisted From stomach. From feeding way too much corn and corn silage and not enough grass and hay. And the pH, and when you metabolize a seed, a seed is a carbohydrate or a starch, and to get the energy out of that, to convert that into glucose, it drops the pH. And so acidosis, these cows, instead of being 6'5", they're on 40 pounds of corn silage, 5 pounds of, uh, of distillers, and 3 pounds of soybean, and 20 pounds of grain, their pH is in the fives, and they have no immune system. And it's a veterinarian's dream. 
And when I would have these guys, and I had like 15 of them in my practice, and the other ones were in other people's practice, local veterinarians around, and they'd say, I'm going to go organic, they'd say, oh, why don't you just call Detloff and don't bother me? I don't know what, I can't help you. Yeah. And so I had clients in about five practices when I quit in my own practice. And when I'd see a guy that I got $18,000 out of, we had calf problems and he'd start feeding whole milk and we'd attack the onis in the herd. And all of a sudden his cows would, would drop down to 60 pounds and his vet bill would be 3,000. I mean, I, lo I would lose consistently. Mary, and I'm not kidding, my wife can vouch for this, 75% of their vet business in about two years when they would just back off. And in the paradigm of Organic Valley and Horizon and whoever's in it now, if they're on grass base, high forage, their cows live to be, they expect seven, eight calves and they'll sell their heifers. And it's, uh, it's not a good market now, but historically heifers have been very good for the big, the, the, Acidotic herds that burn and churn, and uh, it's an intangible profit on the bottom line. Um, well, I know that's why there was so much resistance in outside communities to accepting managed grazing. Because as soon as you get the cows in the exercise program, and there's, there's multiple things yet that we're still learning the benefits yes. to the actual cow harvesting her own feed but it completely, it whips them into shape. It, they last longer, they're healthier. You the don't feet, have- You don't have the feet problems. You don't have the DAs. Um, it just goes on and on. And now there's research being done. Um, the Organic Valley has worked with Washington State University in that the CLAs are way up on fresh grass. The omega-3, omega-6 ratio, we've got some herds that are almost one-to-one. -one. That's incredible. Yeah, and, uh, and now we're doing... And to sidestep, CLA is conjugated linoleic acid. And, it's, and tell us a little bit about CLA. CLAs are anti-cancer. They the, Conjugating linoleic acid, if you get enough of that, that suppresses cancer. Your omega-3, omega-6 is related to cholesterol and your fatty acid profile. They're doing work now on fatty acids, and they're finding grass is unbelievable. And that's why the grass milk is phenomena has really taken off. Uh, it's a health food. Well, so, I, I have to tell you, Dr. Paul, this has just been an amazing discussion with you. Now, are we going to get together again and talk some more down the road? Because you have such a fantastic um, lab out here, right here in Trumplow County, and not too far from Blair and Arcadia, nestled in the beautiful Driftless area. That would be your call. Uh, I am retiring from Organic Valley uh, June 30th. I'll be 76, so I got to slow down a little bit and concentrate on our succession. We have a daughter that's very interested in this, whom you've met. And so we've got three years of training, and uh, I'll be doing probably more speaking around. And uh, I've got time for a garden this year, which I have neglected my garden for years and stuff. but. Um, yeah, my, my goal in life isn't to pile up a lot of money, it's to pass on my personal experiences and what I've gathered just by reading. Thank you for the hard work for all of the ag community, not only here in Trumplow County, but as I do, it's, it's echoed across the United States and across the planet. I do have a new book coming out. We're doing the last proofing of it, and it's called uh, Sustainable Egg, Egg for the Ages. The title may change, but I've got everything from a herbal hedgerows, what a, what a herbal hedgerow could be. It's a pharmaceutical plant that cows can go in and graze on when they need them. How awesome. And, uh, and when will that be coming out? Uh, it'll be, it's within 90 days, should be here. Do I get an autographed copy? It, you sure do. There we go. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking time for your schedule to visit with us, Dr. Paul. Thank you, Mary. Uh, it was very enjoyable, and I hope if one person learns something, that's worth it.